good morning guys and thanks for joining and this is going to be 40 hour session minimum and like around 40 to 45 hours so in this what we try to cover we try to cover will not spend much time on basics I, I believe everybody knows a little bit cloud and especially as your 900 everybody has done free certifications right so we'll spend some time on a day-to-day -day administration activities along with that we'll try and concentrate how you can develop or design a solutions in azure that is our main aim apart from that we'll try to cover some of the automation steps with the terraform and with the azure devops okay we'll, we'll try to we'll try to include both of them as much as we can right but that is that is just an add-on nothing related with the official course content okay so let's start with the basic fundamentals i just want to see how many of you are aware about the cloud already or if you are already working on it it's good and i, I know some of the some of you guys are fairly new uh, and if you have a fair amount of idea about what is the fundamental difference between your traditional data center and cloud platform so I just want to understand one thing, how your traditional on-premise works. Then we'll talk about cloud platform. Anybody? Let's say you're working from, now since last one year, everybody is working from home. So let's say back to office. So working from office and you have one of the customer maybe in USA and he has some of the DC. <clears throat> so how you will operate it and what all the different job roles that you will see. Anybody? No, Anurag? Yeah, Srinivas, I was giving chance to the audience. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, we will need, uh, minimum we need is VPN, VPN connectivity. Okay. And uh, with the help of VPN, we will use our internet, let's say Airtel, to uh, connect uh, to the customer DC with the help mm -hmm. of VPN. And uh, I don't want to use some high fundu terms, but we will have a VPN tunnel so that this traffic cannot be hacked by a hacker that is the whole purpose of vpn so mm -hmm. that's it it's a direct link a logically direct link uh, between our laptop <clears throat> and dc yeah okay right so if you consider this is a simple delivery center okay and you you have a you have a support staff and developers and architects and then obviously etc etc so when i say support staff we have admins okay that can be network that can be server storage or maybe that can be l1 monitoring irrespective so how many job roles that you see if you want to manage the traditional data center that that is what i want to understand right so when i talk about traditional data center it's all about three components majorly right i uh, guess we have roughly around 10 or 15 members so everybody's job role is revolve around CPU, that's it, nothing else, I believe. Okay, or, what, or in other words, what I can say, more in detail, that's it. Right. In network, you will see L1, L2, L3, or maybe architect. In storage, you'll have a couple of different roles. In server, 
you'll have uh, multiple job roles to manage. Let's say Windows or Wintel or VMware or Linux, right? Or maybe front end application support, or maybe SQL DBA or any other traditional database administrators, right? So let's consider everybody under one roof support staff. And then you'll have developers or maybe architects and VMs. So if you want to manage roughly around, let's say 5,000 servers, right? You need some of these job roles based on the business model or based on the customer. Okay. And in terms of technical standpoint, as you said, yes, we need a VPN between these two offices to allow these people to work remotely and support one of your customer. Now, when I talk about cloud, how this will transition? Okay, the setup will obviously change and the, the job roles will also obviously change. So what all those major changes? Any, any thoughts, anybody? Any guess? But still, still people will embed it into respect to individual job roles, whatever the whatever the cloud role. Let's say Windows L1. What you will do? Monthly patching. Okay, CPU memory alerts. Maybe hardening, right? And so on. You'll you'll get you'll get around 30 tickets in a 30 days. So for these kind of job roles, even if you adopt the cloud, there is no difference. And right? you still have to do the same. So that is the reason why some of the job roles are still restricted or restricted with the traditional job roles. I mean, I'm not, if, let me know if I'm going on a bit higher level or, right, so, Let's talk about your cloud offerings. So if you take <clears throat> if you take any of the cloud vendor, let's say AWS major player or Azure or GCP or now IBM is converting their cloud platform right into a separate division just to beat above three. And we still have large brands, but not the, not they are not the large players in the cloud world, right? You take anything, majorly they will offer the services in following ways. One is your IAS and PaaS. Right. <clears throat> so before we discuss about the IAS, how how your traditional virtualization works? Anybody has a VMware experience? I know few. Sir. No. Right. Imagine you're working on a traditional data center environment. Normally, when you when you get a request to build any virtual machine, let's say you have a base hardware, uh, let's say Cisco M two forty or C two two forty, I believe I forgot the model. Yeah, C two forty M four or M five latest. What we will do? We'll try to install some sort of the virtualization software. I would say, technically, we call it as hypervisor. Example, ESXi or Hyper-V or AHV, Nutanix AHV. Right, on top of that, what we will do, we'll try and create our virtual machines. Let's say Windows VM 
and the requirement is SQL Server. Right, in this case, if you look at the hardware capabilities, let's say 128 GB RAM and 32 CPU and 100 GB, V150 GB SSD. That's it. This is the base configuration. And you install, let's say, That's, that's only the utilization from hypervisor side. Out of this, it needs minimum this much of resources. And the rest, if you go back to Windows VM, let's say, right, so this is your Windows storage requirements and this is the other requirement. And when it comes to SQL, obviously, hardly five or ten percent you will leave it to the os rest we will eat it that is the fund of sql right now if you consider this as a, the aim is you need a sql server but how this will work let's say in traditional data center world you'll have a dc engineer who will help you with one-time racking stacking right and once it is done you'll have two hard disk 150 gb and you'll create a RAID, RAID configuration, maybe RAID, RAID 0 or RAID 1. And what we will do, your VMware admin will come and install this, or maybe pre-install in a way this. Right. Once that is done, Windows admin can take care of this, and your SQL admin can take care of this. And if you look at the storage requirements, it hardly has 150 GB of two hard drives, roughly around 300 GB. Now, if the Windows Virtual Machine requirement is one around 1.5 TB or 1.15 TB, normal calculation. So again, on the back end, we'll have a SAN storage admin, right? So one, two, three, four, five, and on a higher level, five different job roles, correct? So if you consider L1, L2, L3, or 24 by seven support model, then you can multiply the number of job roles that you need to manage this. So if something goes wrong, SQL DBA will open up, a, open up a case and Windows side troubleshooting may happen. If, if required, ESX side or a virtualization side troubleshooting may happen. And in worst case scenario, hardware side troubleshooting may also require. In worst case scenario, your Cisco will also engage and do the troubleshooting vendor. Right? This is how we work in traditional way. Now let's consider any of these clouds and any of these cloud offerings, right? So if you consider IAS model, so how we how we work in the IAS model, let's take the same example, right? In even in an IAS model, your hardware will remain same, right? Irrespective of what we are doing, and obviously we connected today for Azure sessions, right? So this is your Hyper-V running on Windows 2002 or sorry, 2012 or 2 still. I don't know if they upgraded to 19. 
and your virtual machine fundamentals will never change. All right, and in your SQL side, this will also never change. You can still install and manage. Same same configuration. I'm not writing down. Right. So what I, what I'm missing here is this hardware is not in my control. This hypervisor is not in my control. And what is in my control is Windows VM and your SQL Server. So obviously, I can cut down the number of job roles back to maybe a cloud admin who can manage the Windows VM or a Linux VM, and maybe the same cloud admin who can manage SQL. If it is a complex solution, then let's, then let's look for SQL DB. And what you are losing here, the, the number of job roles on the back end, you can look at. Because this layer is completely taken care by cloud vendor, right? Or cloud provider, will not say vendor. In our case, Azure, right? So you have a control on these two things as a cloud admin or if you are looking for 104 job role right so if you if you, are, if you guys are preparing for 104 admin admin azure administrator then that is where you fall under right so let's move on to Pass services. Okay, before we move, move on to pass services, I need a couple of examples. In Azure, if you already have some experience, then what all the components that fall under IAS? Anybody? Virtual machine. Virtual machine. VM. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, VNets. Mm -hmm. uh, Disk V disks because in Azure disks are separate. Storage is considered separate from machines. Okay. So commonly used IAS components means in in Azure every component will be treated as a resource, and each resource will be uniquely tracked because each resource has its own billing mechanism. Okay. If you look at the virtual machine. A virtual machine has CPU and memory, it means your billing is associated with CPU and memory. If you are increasing CPU and memory usage, your bill will increase. When it comes to disk, it is the amount of storage that you are utilizing. So based on the amount of per GB basis, the amount of storage which you are using, your bill will be decided. When it comes to VNet, on a bigger picture, you don't see any pricing associated with the VNet. When I say pricing, pricing, no pricing associated with the VNet, but when you are sending any data out from the VNet and bringing any data in, then there will be inbound outbound charges for the VNet. Again, that is per GB basis. If you are sending locally, 10 rupees. If you are sending globally, 20 rupees, maybe 25 rupees. It's all flexible pricing like your flight charges. Right. Some of them are fixed components and some of them are variable components. We'll try and understand whenever we discuss about a specific component, we'll, ask, we'll also consider that pricing aspect and how you can optimize those components when you are deploying them. And any other components, anybody? Within, within IAS? Yeah, okay, you still have your security groups we call it as network security groups and your firewall as a service firewall is a fast service but we need this pass service to be embedded in IAS implementations and you still have traditional firewalls where you can deploy a vm and use it and your your vpn components and active right. directory sorry i missed ad Azure AD is completely pass. 
it's not come under is it, it, okay if you want to no, run we IS need component, it we need that right? integration right so your azure ad is correlated component with the ias but th that's not fall under ias you know what i mean <clears throat> right so i'll explain when we talk about pass component let's move on to pass and let me drill down this this is this will remain same okay there's no change let's say i want to use the same sql server same sql server in a pass model right how it will work let's say when it comes to platform as a service what do you mean by platform as a service i need i need any use case let's say you have startup a development firm at where people are working purely on asp or maybe java or maybe node.js and so on. okay but they hardly know these things and let's say in their laptop they'll simply have this studio code or maybe visual studio that's it nothing else so their aim is if they are done with the coding let's say or whatever the code that they are developing if they are done with that they have their repos they will save the code and everything in order to integrate with the database they need some test database okay commonly what we will do you'll you'll segregate that into dev uat and prod environments or within a prod you have stages that we will see right but in a, when a when a developer perspective if you look at they are more interested in developing a code and testing on a daily basis Right. So in that case, they need a small database where they can connect these applications and test it, execute and try to find out whether it is working or any modifications required on the code, something like that. In that case, what they need, they simply need one connection string. That's it. If you can give a connection string, username, password, they are happy. So if if they are working on 24 by 7, no, they will not work on 24 by 7. Normally, you'll see developers will come and go in 9 to 5. So you can you can power on at 9, and you can power off at 10 in the night, maybe if they are working late. So it means SQL Server can always go away on a, on a daily basis. So if that is a requirement, so you can't really install a VM, install a SQL Server, configure the test databases and all. Right. So in that case, what you can do, you can start utilizing pass model. What pass will do? Azure will take care of till the point. Okay, Azure will take care till this point. What you have to do as is, as a developer or maybe as a cloud admin, your responsibility is create a DB container. If you need a two test databases for two different executions, then create a test database and you try to shift your connection strings. Just concentrate on your database containers. That's it. You don't you don't need to bother about what is the SQL version which is running on the back end. I don't know what kind of virtual machine it is running. I don't know. And rest of the stuff anyway, Azure will take care. So you will lose the control of your VM management and SQL management. When it comes to pass everything will be managed by azure then as a admin as a admin or as a developer what is your role you simply create and manage your databases and you just pay me for the databases which you are using in this in this cost model as you say cpu memory building vnet disk and then firewall building rest of the other building components are there when it comes to pass as i said this is one of the example DB is offered in terms of pass service, then how your billing will work. Your billing will work in two ways. One is vCPU, 
or virtual CPU, how many V CPUs that you need, or there is another model called DTU. Database transaction units. So how many transactions that you will execute? Let's say if you want to execute around roughly 10 transactions, 10 concurrent transactions on a database, then you may need a 10 DTU database. For 10 DTU database, 300 rupees per month, roughly. Or maybe 1000 rupees per month. So your day to day headache is gone. You don't need to look at the SQL server. And what, what is the benefit here? You really don't need to look at the SQL server. You don't need to look at the log utilization, indexing, re-indexing, or recreation, or whatever the performance improvement steps that you perform on a weekends. That is avoided. And you don't need to look at the backups and stuff. And anything related to DB user creations, or maybe your schema modifications, or schema shrinking, or if you want to do uh full recovery mode to log recovery mode all the stuff it's everything you vanished you simply have a pass db and connect to it and use it clear right so i need a couple of more examples in pass anybody any any other components that comes under pass so as we mentioned here, uh, Azure AD. Azure AD is pass service. SQL, databases, or maybe any, any other data. You'll have uh, other data. Azure, Azure AD means our, like our uh, typical uh, domain control, right? Uh, I'll show you. I'll show you. Any other components? Your app services completely comes under. Pass. Right. And your AKS. Azure. Can can I do Kubernetes service? It's completely pass service. Okay, but if you look at the database, database functional is totally different with the Active Directory. And you can't really compare what what is a pass. So based on the pass usage, based on the customer usage, the pass definition will define. Right. Then I'm talking about Azure AD. So normal case, if I want Active Directory, what I need, I need a one Windows Server or LDAP, and install the Active Directory, right, and configure it, and promote as a domain controller. Correct. Once you promote it, then you have a choice of adding additional domain controllers and create a, uh, what we'll say, forest and child domains and, and so on. And your complete AD admin or AD expert will come into picture, right? So when it comes to past service, I said Azure AD, not a AD. When I say AD, it is traditionally your Windows AD. So Azure AD means, if you go to your Azure portal, this is your Azure AD. Right. And you can create a users. You can create a groups. Correct. This is completely pass service. Do you have a control on this Active Directory domain controller? Can you do dsa.msc and connect to it and see what's going on inside? and what roles are running, you can't really see it. You know what I mean? This is your Azure defaultly provided Active Directory just to manage this portal and manage roughly around how many components we have, more than 300 components in Azure, right? If you if you con consolidate all these things like this, it will see more than 300 components. Each and every component has its own behavior by nature and it requires certain authentication authorization permissions from user application third party application and self developed applications means it is not just user who is trying to access the application you develop there may be some other application which is trying to access the same application in that case your active directory is capable of controlling everything let's say you have two users 
one is windows admin another one is sql admin how you will segregate in id you create a windows user and provide a admin access in a windows vm and in same active directory you create a db dba guy and create a separate group and he, you will add that group into your windows server also on a sql sql side you will give a permission so that th those particular users can log into sql database with their username and password but other windows admins if they are trying to log in it will say you are not authorized to access the database how you will control that your sql is application and your windows server is simple windows virtual machine you have you have a kind of segregation at the active directory side with the help of your users and groups. Similarly, if you look at Azure Active Directory, I don't know what is running on the backend. I'll say traditional Windows Active Directory only, but it is managed by Azure, not by us. And on front end, you will see your users and groups, applications and their permissions, and you want to connect with your traditional Active Directory, you still have options to connect and so on. So that thing we'll, we'll discuss later on technically but over here fundamentally what i need to understand your azure id is pass service your so ADDS. hello yep. yep suppose we have uh, like suppose if if you use like azure G AD, then no need to like the uh, traditional uh, ad right no no that is a mistake so where you will add your service if i want to add my windows machine into a domain Okay, where you where you will see computer section here. Correct. No, suppose if, if you want to if you want to like the uh, go with the fresh like AD or not only Azure. We don't have suppose like the AD in uh, premises. No, I, I understand. I understand. My question is, let's say I have 50 people working in office, a small right. company, 50 employees. Okay, right. everybody's laptop must be joined to domain. Yes, right. Right. So where is that domain? Uh, you, uh, you are saying this is there. Here it is Active Directory. OK, I do agree. This is, let's say this is Active Directory. <clears throat> now the question is where you will add your computers, how you will join the domain. Do we have any DNS server for this? No. Hmm? Are, you, are you getting my point? No, no, sir. Actually, can you just uh, diagram? So. <laughs> Right, so because in my case, my case, we don't have AD. Okay, no, 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 no. yeah, don't don't confuse yourself here. So let's say you're working in office, and you're saying, yeah, it, this is sorry, this is Azure, and this is remote office. As I said, you have, let's say. AD is here. Right. And you have 50 users. What we normally do is if it's a fairly small company, then we will take at least one or two servers in locally. Right. So one is AD. And another one is your file print or file shares, whatever. Right, so you need to create in AD, you need to create 50 users. Also, all the 50 laptops or desktop, you will join into this AD so that whenever they'll come to office or remotely they join. So their username and password is there and they have their dedicated system. Everything is tracked in your Active Directory, correct? Now, additionally, what they need, they need mailboxes. So what you will do, you'll go to O365, there is no relation between your O365 and Azure. Please remember, right? So this AD you will synchronize with O365 and you will create 50 mailboxes here. So everybody can log in with the same username and password and their mailbox will work. Normally when they log in into the laptop, they will open uh, the Outlook. It will automatically log in. It won't ask for any other username password unless the password is changed, correct? So this is how so so, so as, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you said like the if you have o65 account then we don't have create a user on ad right no this user 
AD will be synchronized here. You need AD still. This AD is mandatory because this is the key where we are doing authentication and authorization. If a user is locked, he will not be able to log in into laptop. No, no, he will not be able to log into laptop. That's fine. But he has a mobile. He, he is he is accessing a Outlook. Then what is the point of security? That Outlook will also give a throw. Uh, it will also give the error, error message, right? Your password needs to be changed. Even if you are accessing in your mobile, it, maybe it will work for a minute or two if your synchronization is slow. But obviously, after one minute or two minutes, you will see Outlook will also down on your mobile because your O365 account will also get locked along with the AD. Silivers. Yes. Um, uh, just a quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, on the left side, of the servers that we have, I think what he's trying to say, I do not want to buy a server. I don't want to buy any server. Can I mm -hmm. place these servers, AD server as a VM in right side in Azure only? Can I you just have options? VM? V VM is VM. You can place it anywhere. No, no, sir. Right. I'm saying I'm saving. I don't have AD in my premises. Then you can't work it. That's what I'm saying. You need an AD. That's hundred percent requirement. Okay, but suppose if if uh, if uh, if I don't have, have AD in my premises, so can we uh, create AD on Azure? Yes, we can create an AD on Azure. You put one VM, convert that into a domain controller, and use it. That will act as AD. Okay. No, no, this is too lengthy process. I don't know these people will uh, support me or not. I don't want this concept. Then you have one more concept called Azure ADDS domain services. OK, okay. these two are different and this is different. What I'm talking about here. This is different. OK, then what is the base solution? Suppose if you don't have the. <laughs> that is what. You need you need at least a VM and convert that into a domain controller, or else use ADD ADDS. So AD see Azure AD domain services. So this is altogether a different component. You need to create it separately. And this so the, yeah. So sorry to interrupt. Um. So we cannot be pure cloud company today. We definitely need a IS based AD or ADDS can replace that IS based AD. AD, right? In Azure, right? If you if you have some if you have some Active Directory large enterprise and you have multiple offices across the globe, in every office you will see one AD server. Okay. So we cannot host all of this in Azure today. We cannot completely yeah. be dependent. If you, if you host it, let's say I have an office in Chennai. So I can host one Active Directory server in Azure in South India region. That will survive the requirement. But let's say I have a user in, uh, I have one more office in, let's say, Assam, and uh, my hosted service is in Chennai AD. Then every every day when a user goes to office in Assam, then they will see if they will try to authenticate, their response will be like after 30 seconds. Every user response is delayed by 30 seconds. Mm, right, so it will be slow. Understood? Okay. So that's the reason why we always recommend if you are running a floor, you are spending that time, you have to have one server in your local floor for Active Directory that will resolve your latency issues when your users are logging in otherwise you what what people will say my my laptop is taking five minutes to log in they will open up a ticket in a local it team right mm -hmm. if you want to solve those kind of challenges this is what the requirement while designing these kind of stuff right we, we're completely deviating let's go back but suppose sir, sir suppose if we have suppose ad okay then we have to again we have to purchase adc right like the backup server we also take and I, I'm not understanding what you're saying. Suppose if, if we make AD okay on premises, okay, then we have again we have uh, we have to one backup server. Right? Backup server. You, you cannot call it as a backup server. That it can be either additional domain controller or a 
or a different server in Azure and add it to a add it to existing Active Directory forest as an additional domain controller. Technical term is ADC, additional domain controller. That, that okay. means uh, one server is enough right now, if we say. No, if one server is down, you are asking your one lakh employees to stay back unless we fix the one server. So suppose, so in my case, suppose if you have 100 users in one location. Then you, are, okay. you can ask 100 people to uh, hang on. Their laptops won't, won't log in. With the, uh, maybe their laptops will log in with the local username and password, but Outlook won't work. So you have to ask your uh, your guys to hang on for 10 minutes unless until you reboot the AD in your local office. If you don't have a secondary server, that is a challenge. And it's up to you how you want to run the business. But technically, you need two minimum. Minimum two server. Yeah. Right. So let's let's come back. So we, we completely deviating. That is not the aim or idea behind explaining the Active Directory, but this is how the pass components will work. We are concentrating on the pass. We are not concentrating on Active Directory. This is not AD training. Correct. So any other any other pass components? No. Yes. Cisco WebEx is a kind of PaaS what we are, you are using right now, or no? no maybe it is it's a not SaaS. PaaS. It's a SaaS. It's SaaS. Okay. It's a SaaS model, right? So okay, so let's move on to SaaS model. In SaaS also. The fundamental, okay, let me copy rather than redeploying this. Sorry. In SAS model, this, is, this will remain same. Let's say, You have a service now. How many people worked on service now? Any anybody? Any idea? Oh, 365. Service now, ticketing system, or remedy ticketing system, or Jira ticketing system, or any other ticketing system. No, we are using service now. Right. So service now is completely SaaS model. Let's say. You have a Windows server, you need some software that needs to be installed. Let me service now base software dot service now dot exe. You'll install it and you'll configure it. So you, you'll offer it for one user. Now I don't want to offer in such a model. What I'll do uh, in a cloud, let's say I have a I have a service now running. I'll not say it is running in Azure. I don't know where they are running, maybe on AWS. Okay. But how, how it will function traditionally, this is how. Like this. Okay, so in service now, let's say customer one has its own portal. Customer two has its own portal. Customer three has its own portal. So what they will do, they will, they will run the backend infrastructure. They will run the software. They will configure everything and they'll simply give you instance, let's say. And there is some some option there is if you want to demo, it'll, it'll, it'll launch the instance. What what it will do? I don't know from where I can get a demo. Yes. Maybe. I forgot the URL. Maybe I'll, I'll show you some some other time. So normally, what happens? There's 
another portal developer.servicenow.com so what happens if you need your own let's say you, you're working for a company and where company has service now dot com some what is your portal maybe abc.servicenow.com if you log in then you will be pointed to this instance and let's say wipro is using service now let's say then that will be pointed to this instance you are just using the end product you are just using the end product you are not managing maintaining any software you are not managing maintaining any database any application any server any hardware nothing you are simply end audience or end user for this product it's completely saas product right so everything on the back end will be controlled by your cloud provider or a cloud vendor any other examples means nothing is in your hand you just have to use the end result they are offering certain services in a certain format you just have to take it salesforce a complete complete saas product any other products that you come across completely yeah. saas 0365 yeah. 0365 and azure yes 0365 is complete saas model now in this case what happens your o365 is not part of azure they are having their own portal maybe the service on the o365 service on running on the same data center in every every part of the world that you never know you know what i mean your o365 is running on some server so where those servers are sitting or some applications where you host those applications exchange server where you will host it those things might be are running on azure data center only but they have a different portal o365 portal from there you will manage it inside the azure you don't see anything related to o365 correct because there is no point of giving access to azure portal for o365 users because it's a completely saas product users can log in into simple o365 portal and use it and the billing model is completely different per mailbox 50 dollar per month you will get all the office suit or you are a startup then you just need a mailbox and sky for business or maybe teams that's it then 20 dollars per month per user fixed price or you need all the products like your your office suit that that includes word excel powerpoint and visio all the stuff then you need to you may need to pay 50 dollars per month per user so if you have 100 users 100 mailboxes into 50 dollars that is your outlook billing correct so here in azure will offer saas services also but in in microsoft perspective saas is segregated for o365 any other webex the primary example every company is using webex cisco webex but zoom. it's not microsoft but it's a yeah. paas yeah zoom completely completely saas product and your slack if you guys are using slack it's completely saas right so you have a lot more things even in your slack every organization can create their own slack instance remember if you are a developer focused company then you need a slack integration for everything right so those things are there are comes under saas apart from that we still have a couple of more offerings what we call it as backup as a service right some of the organizations let's say if you are if you are working as veeam they will offer backup as a service solutions it will utilize cloud as a backend repository for your backups 
right? In in that case, your you, that might be Azure or that might be AWS, that might be some other cloud platform with their own cloud. We never know, but that is also one of the offering model, and BCDR business continuity disaster recovery as a service some of the companies will offer product is correct zerto any other and some in some of the small cloud uh, cloud vendors or cloud providers they will see a anything as a service what do you mean by anything as a service they don't have any specific directions to serve the customers if they can crack the customers they can offer anything let's let's say they need uh, some sort of uh, uh, ia services we we will do it or a complete pass we will do it or bcdr we will do it they'll simply say you come up with the problem statement and we have a solutions ready for you you can see these kind of things are hosted in Alibaba or maybe Blue Coat and some other small cloud vendors. You'll, you'll, you'll see these kind of notations over there. Okay. So as I said, majorly people will use IAS, PaaS, and SaaS. Okay, <clears throat> right. So what we need to start with or where we need to start with if you want to learn this azure let's go back to here you'll see these many components are there what i mentioned in my customized course content now if you want to start learning these things where we will we will start Right. So before we go ahead and start, we still have a couple of fundamentals. Right. Let's understand Azure fundamentals first. Then we'll see from where we can start. Or we'll say basics. Well, we'll spend some time on Azure basics. Let's say if I want to use for any organization if i want to use azure from where we should start anybody no. um, understand the requirements i mean am understand. i getting your question right I mean, what is it that you want to put on the cloud? I mean, that's how you learn, right? right. No, if a company has decided to use Azure, so let's do some R&D around this. We are trying to use it. So where we should start? Hello. Mm. The same thing. Yeah, so the requirements gathering, we need to understand what are the requirements and then try to map Your... it with once we yeah. know it, no one you're, talk, it. you're talking solution perspective. Okay, others? Maybe we need an Azure account. Okay, if you need an account, what email ID? It will support everything, right? If you look at, if you look at my email address, it's my personal. Now I said my question is for an organization perspective. Okay, so the thing is, let's say, we'll use this email ID for any organization example. Okay, we'll create an account. So even if you use this email ID, or if I use this email ID, there's no difference. Email ID is email ID. The fundamental difference is when you create an account in Azure portal. This is where you create an account, right? 
So with this email ID, if you create an account, even with this email ID, if you create an account, you will get an tenant ID. So how to create an account more of self explanatory how you will create your Gmail account. Right, so go to Active Directory. And. Go to properties somewhere. Properties. And you will see tenant ID. Copy. For me, this is the tenant. ID. But if I want to. Ask my let's say 20 developers are working here. So how I will give access for 20 developers. I have this account, so in my account only they will deploy it, whatever the resources that they need and bill bill has to be paid by me or if, if you look at the organization's perspective, you have you have 1 lakh employees out of 1 lakh. Let's say 4000 people are IT. Out of 4,000 IT, roughly around 200 and 200 odd people, 250 odd people needs Azure Access. Okay, so you now see the filtration. Out of 1 lakh employees, you need to provide access to only 250 people. So all these 250 employees will deploy, delete, create, update, and manage some of the components on a daily basis. Right? So, but they will not get get any bill on their home. The bill will be generated and given to the organizations as an invoice. So how you need to set up that? If you, if you are doing your if you are creating your own account for practice, that is different story. Just like how I did. You enroll your Gmail ID. Or enroll with your Outlook and create an account. Then to take a subscription. We'll discuss subscription later on, but you're, you're ready to go. But in, in organization's perspective, how? Now you got it. Anurag, what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking in uh, architecting perspective solutioning. You are asking the right. details. Yeah. Right. Now, all these 20 people will log in and use my account or means my subscription to do day to day activities. On behalf of me, they, they deploy it, manage it, delete it, whatever they want to do, whatever the rights that I provided, they will perform the task. And at the end of the month, I'll get a bill. How that will work? So this is a concurrent user. And so what we can log in your email. Yes. Um, uh, it, uh, okay, now I cannot share my uh, Gmail ID and password or Outlook ID password for them. Ask them to log in my account and you do whatever you want to do it anyway and give the product to me. And at the end of the month, whatever the bill I'll get, I'll pay it. I can't really do that. Uh, what I have to do is I'll ask them to create their own user accounts with their email ID. And once the email IDs users got created, I will assign a right permission to right people. How that can be done. So for that, the prerequisite is your tenant ID. So when you're creating a tenant ID, if you are using it for your home lab purpose or your personal learning, this is completely fine. But if you are working for an organization, let's say so and so company, your directory account must be set up by one of the admin or owner account. So let's say the same thing is assigned to the sales account. Now, there is a user called abc at sorry xyz at abc.com one of the user he create same same domain he created an account and he is trying to access something he is also part of this tenant id only he won't get a new tenant id because the domain is same so who will has to pay the bill? Whoever is holding this tenant ID, they will get the bill. And other 200 employees, they don't, they don't, they'll see the bill, but they are not the owners for that billing, what, the, what is generated. You know what I mean? So if you see this tenant ID, this is uniquely tracked identity for your Azure portal as a, as a tenant. So how to create a tenants? You can create a tenants 
for multiple businesses. You have a three business divisions, right? Three business units. You can you can create a multiple tenants and keep the users in a segregated mode. Let's say one business unit that they want to sell off, create a new tenant and migrate the resources, subscriptions on all the cloud services into the tenant and sell the tenant to XYZ company so that the, the tenant will go to the XYZ company. They will use it separately. You don't see, uh, so let's say Friday is cut over date. So for, out of 1000 servers, you are you are selling 200 servers to different company. So you move those resources over the weekend, put it into a different tenant and hand out to them. By Monday, if you log in in your subscription, you will see 200 servers minus. All right, that is where the significance of tenant ID come into picture. Unique identification or unique user tracking or unique domain tracking. Okay, so even for your lab purpose, if you want to, if you want to practice it, you need to take your account first. The moment you create an account, you will get this tenant ID. Right? If you want to change this tenant ID, you can always change, but you need to transfer all the associated components under one tenant to another tenant. If you are if you are trying to delete the old tenant, please remember. Right. So once this is created, you need to take a subscriptions. OK, what do you mean by subscription? Sorry, you're not audible. You're not audible. A bit louder, please. We are talking Ravi. I guess he lost. Right, fine. So, subscription means let's say you have an account, and as I said in Azure, you have more than 300 services. If you want to use general services, let's say 10 rupees, and analytic services, let's say 100 rupees. Each and every component has its own billing mechanism, as I said. So if you want to utilize it, if you want to utilize these things, you need to put set some subscription, which is your billing mechanism for the resources that you are utilizing in Azure. Means, means let's say uh, you are you are using 10 web servers. So how much bill that you will get? and how you will pay so the billing will be processed by associated with the uh, processed by or associated with the subscription under one tenant id you can have multiple subscriptions based on the business requirement let's say all the development aspects will go into these subscriptions uh, let me go back to my subscriptions first i'll show you Go to subscriptions. I have cleaned up the other other subscriptions which are free, and I've, I've the disabled ones. I would say so. There are in a, in a, if you look at the YouTube previous videos, so you will see four subscriptions here. One is your free trial. Another one is your pass. So those subscriptions I've cleaned up, and I've I've kept only these two. Uh, two active pay as you go subscriptions. So normally. The, you can set up, you can set up a subscriptions for the business requirement like this. Let's say I've set up one for for day to day deployments. Another one for for day to day automation. So this is my perspective. OK, let's say if an organization's perspective, an organization has, let's say, six or five different subscriptions. OK, so how the how that will work? Let's say first subscription development, second UAT and third production. All right, fourth DR. 
and fifth will be your r and d or testing or uh, self learning means if you take a subscription like this self learning two years let's say you have a support suppose you have a customer contract or maybe you are a premium customer with the microsoft you took a subscription right and the subscription is going to add let's say 100 dollar per month for 24 months means you will get one subscription okay you give a name whatever the name that you want to give it so that subscription is free and the maximum limit is hundred dollars and every month you will get loaded with hundred dollars for next two years why because i have let's say 200 employees who are working on azure day to day if they are running into some issues they want to do some r d they want to practice or they want to simulate the same problem what they are getting on the production if they want to practice it they need some sort of subscription where they can go and seamlessly deploy the things to do some r d and regenerate the problem and try to find out the solution so for that this subscription can be used and what Azure says, you will get loaded with $100. Ask your employees to utilize it on a monthly basis for their learning purposes. And rest of the rest of the environments are pretty much controlled by your Active Directory roles and responsibilities, RBAC access, and your development people can only develop the, can only deploy or manage the development components. Let's say app services. That's it. UAT people, they have some some sort of UAT tools that, that they'll use to connect to the environment. So only those tools they can come, they can manage it with the UAT subscription. Production, so you have a L1, L2, L3 support teams in normal case. In in the cloud world, let's say you have a uh, admin support level zero and the expert support. So two things are two tier, tier one, tier two supporting, and you will you'll get access based on the support model in the production subscription and dr also if you are if you have a bcdr engineers or site re site reliability engineers which is way, way beyond what we're talking uh, right so site reliability engineers job is not that easy what we're talking so for that they'll have a complete access on the portal and they'll manage whatever they want to do it in terms of uh, setting up the business continuity and site site reliability or a customer business uh, business redundancy i would say those things will be handled in a separate in a separate manner right so these are how we organize the subscriptions okay but what what kind of subscriptions we have in azure let's say if you are looking for your day-to-day -day practice you go with the free subscription you will get it for 30 days. Okay. And you will be loaded with, I believe, some 13,000 rupees or 12,000 rupees per month. And once that is over, then this account, this subscription will automatically get disabled and they won't charge any additional amount. <clears throat> and there is one more thing called Azure Pass. If you attend the official Azure training, you'll get this $100 pass for everyone. You can utilize this. Again, they has a time boundary. One month is the limit. You can utilize and accounts get locked or disabled after a month. Apart from that, if you are a student, they introduce a new subscription called 12 months free subscription for students. If they want to learn something on the Right, but they, they will not be able to deploy all the components. There are certain limitations, maybe some uh, app services or some storage account or some database or very limited components that they can deploy. They can't deploy all the components what they want to practice it. But this is again free and also you'll get around 300, $300 of uh, credit added to your, your student pass or your your account for students subscription and you can utilize it for 12 months i believe 
apart from that there is pay as you go model means you are okay to pay whatever the amount that they are saying you are okay to pay that amount and the condition is when you are using it you pay it when you are don't when you don't use it you just delete it and the bill will be stopped let's say i'm, I'm running a class morning seven to nine let's so these two hours i will i will deploy something in azure after nine o'clock i'll delete everything so i have to pay for two hours so considering that two hours every day uh, let's say 30 days building will be if i go back to my subscriptions come on now i saw last month around how much 500 out of which where i spend a lot of the lot of my billing okay so this is for december and january january it is not yet generated it's around 500 so even if i run for two hours every day it's roughly i'm getting around 500 to 1000 rupees per month right this is one subscriptions i have two subscriptions right another one is terraform so in that subscription also i'll get one more bill so this is monthly model where you where you'll go and pay apart from that there is an enterprise subscription where organizations will go, do the negotiation with the vendor cloud cloud vendor which is in our case azure so in that case what happens if our organization is agreed with the some sort of agreement says i will stay with you for next three years i will not go away so can you give me some discount because i'm doing a long-term business with you so you might be seeing some of those subscriptions in your organizations where there is an upper limit let's say whether you use it or don't use it minimum bill that that is generated let's say two thousand dollars whether whether the customer is deploying the things or he is simply keeping the subscription as it is empty still he will he will get charged two thousand dollars minimum per month and anything above two thousand they will have to pay separately that means they you you deploy whatever you, you deploy whatever the things that you want to deploy there is a, some components some uh hot sort of business model that they have let's say a developer company so developer company really don't need some of the ias ias firewalls and stuff or if they need they have they'll have to add it back to the solution that's a different story but some components agreed components agreed components means as a as a company i go back to azure and ask them my aim is product developing this product and i, I want to launch this product into azure so this product needs these 20 components so can you give me some customized billing for these 20 components above that if i deploy any additional component you take whatever the building your normal building model as per your normal building model in that case you will get certain components in the, in your enterprise subscription and whether you use it don't use it you are okay to pay 2000 if you are using above that then you'll get additional bill so those kind of customized pricing subscription model is available for organizations and in that you no need to pay uh, you know you no need to use your credit card or debit card to pay their bill in a monthly basis you will get an invoice generated and you will you will uh, do the payment through your purchase orders okay and apart from that you have csp model or i don't know the word how what we use some third party vendors they will offer the they will offer the subscriptions let's say in india you are a gold partner with microsoft and you do have a rights to sell the subscriptions for on behalf of azure let's say azure pay as you go model you are paying 2000 you go and take the you go and take the csp model subscription from third party maybe you'll get 20 percent discount let's say 16 1600 dollars per month is the bill so you will definitely go and take it because you're straight away getting 20 percent discount but the condition is 
your your support will be from the third party partner who is giving the subscription not from the azure directly means they have a, some some uh, guidelines between your third party and your azure what they will do they will offer some of the services at the primary stage if there is a critical issue then they will route it back to microsoft so that microsoft can reduce their overhead in a support model that is where cs space will come into picture so overall you need a subs you need a tenant id and you need a subscriptions so this is how we organize the subscriptions for enterprise and these are all available subscription models right so these are the three aspects where we need to start with now how to take the subscription and afterwards how we can decide where we need to deploy the things and all that we will discuss tomorrow same time okay so i'll stop here if you guys have any questions we can we can take it we still have 5 minutes alex anurag navin uh, yeah, I'm yeah, Alex, tell me. No, no, nothing from my side. I'm clear with this student. All right, so maybe some of these things are really boring because of the fun <laughs> theoretical or fundamental, but I hope one or two freshers, those who really need these kind of things. So for them, I'm just covering off. You can see the same sort of videos in YouTube, but yeah i'm just uh, trying to give you an overview in first two or three sessions then we'll start with the actual labs and all from the awareness downwards i just have a quick question uh, yeah. shrinivas uh, if you yeah. can answer very quickly uh, yeah. whether we go multi tenant or we go multi subscription under single tenant which under is a under, way? under one tenant you can have a multiple subscriptions okay so big organizations which are using azure do they go multi tenant or do they go multi subscription you, you will see multiple subscriptions under one tenant let's say there are some legal obligations between the tenants there are three divisions in the same roof then okay uh, they'll create three different tenants okay but the general principle is keep tenants low subscription yes. high that's subscription the high principle. yes whenever okay. whenever you sell off the business a part of the business what you can do you can move the resources into one subscription and you create a new tenant and transfer this subscription into a new tenant and leave it so that you can you can break the chain and others will log in from the different portal so uh, others will log in from the different tenant so that they will see those segregated resources okay got it that's it. thanks right so adarsh adarsh i don't know yes we must yeah you good so guys uh, any questions you can ping me on the group it's so fine so we'll stop here and we'll connect back tomorrow same time so tomorrow we'll discuss about azure fundamentals i would say uh, regions zones availability zones sets and stuff that we will discuss tomorrow and then i will talk about the networking afterwards Right. Yeah. Srinivas, we don't have the uh, rights on the WhatsApp group. We cannot query you. you oh, yeah, I'll enable it. it. Yeah, because I'll enable it. Give me like one or two days. I'll enable it. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Thank but, you yeah, I have seen a lot of other people who join. I don't know. Maybe some, uh, some demos people will join and they'll, they'll keep on asking the questions. So I can't answer every five minutes or 10 minutes. So that's why I disabled it. Once we have a granular level, okay, these people will continue. Then we'll enable it and you, we can discuss more. Okay, great. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's catch up tomorrow. Same time. Bye-bye. Thanks.